Hey everyone, this is Rob Keens with goldsilverpros.com. It is Thursday, January 21st, 2021. And the update I think you all have been waiting for, have been pounding me with emails and on Twitter and even on the YouTube channel. We're going to do an update on the LBMA gold market and the NSFR. I'll explain what those are in a moment for those of you who may not have been following the channel. And this will be my third video on the topic. And then I've got a very, very special announcement for you at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. We're going to go ahead and get into the presentation and get you guys caught up on the NSFR. This is our update on the NSFR and the London gold market. Uh, there are two previous videos on this one I gave about a week and a half to two weeks ago that has about 18,000 views and it's talking about uh, the London market and some issues they had with Dubai kind of leads into the NSFR argument and then a video I did just a few days ago I think it's up to over 40,000 views that gave an update on this as well so this would be the third part in the series and I want to clarify some things in the series and get a little bit more precise and I'm doing that thanks to a couple Twitter Twitter followers who kind of took me to task for not really drilling down on this enough. And then also I think people wanted my opinion as to what the effect of the implementation of NSFR could be. So we'll get into that in this presentation moving forward. What is NSFR? Well, at its most simple, NSFR, the net stable funding ratio, is part of Basel III requirements, which is being implemented over a period of time in response to the last financial crisis. If you remember back to Lehman and the crisis of 2008-2009, there were issues with bank liquidity in the system. And so NSFR is part of Basel III rules designed to deal with that. Originally came out in 2014. Some of the Basel rules were supposed to be implemented in 2018 and on. And we've had some moving dates there. And that's part of what I'm going to clarify here more than I did in my previous videos. So the net stable funding ratio, according to this BIS press release, which you can go to simply type that URL at the top of this slide into your browser. The NSFR is a significant component of the Basel III reforms. It requires banks to maintain a stable funding profile in relation to their on and off balance sheet activities, thus reducing the likelihood that disruptions to a bank's regular sources of funding will erode its liquidity position in a way that could increase the risk of its failure and potentially lead to broader systemic stress. In other words, let's figure out a way to capitalize a bank so they don't crash again like we did in Lehman and almost take out down the global financial system. That's essentially what that means. The NSFR will become a minimum standard by the 1st of January, 2018. Now, originally when it was designed, it was supposed to kick into gear the first day of 2018. We'll say, see in the ensuing slides how it wasn't and how some of the rest of Basel III outside the NSFR was also pushed back. So according to another BIS press release, now before I get into some of the date changes, I have to admit, going to the BIS's website here at BIS.org has been sort of a pain in the butt. I mean, getting the website's not hard, but navigating and finding information is kind of a pain in the butt. They do, uh, like a lot of regulator websites and financial websites, they release things in sequential order, but their search function is really horrible. So I spent a couple hours really around their website and also looking on the internet to get some of the exhibits I'm going to show you today. It's just difficult to get to. So I hope I did enough research to really clarify the dates and the requirements. So... According to this press release, some parts of Basel III were deferred due to the closures we had because of the virus. Uh, the title of this press release, Governor and Head of Supervision, Governors and Heads of Supervision announced deferral Basel III implementation to respond to the virus. Now, only some of them. So I pulled the actual table from this press release out and stuck it as an attachment. And you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of Basel III that are being moved back to 2023, the 1st of January, 2023. That's roughly two years from now. Those, however, do not include NSFR. And NSFR is the one we care about. And I'll explain in the presentation why. If you have not been following my presentations on LBA, COMEX, Collusive Ponzi scheme, and how the NSFR plays a role in that, I'll get into that in this video uh, but you probably, after watching this video, want to go back to the first two parts, and then you'll really get uh, deeper into the bigger picture. All right, moving on. Now, again, according to another press release on BIS.org, the Basel III timelines were originally thus. If you look at the very, very bottom of this slide, and I included the whole table here, but if you look at the bottom, the liquidity measures, there's two, liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio. We're focusing on the last one. So it's the very last line on this chart, the very, very bottom. It was supposed to have started in 2018. Some of the other parts uh, that we talked about in the previous slide, e.g. these, 
We're supposed to start at other times, mostly uh, 2022, 2021, and 2023. But the NSFR has been pushed back. How did I find this? Well, it wasn't on the Basel III website. It was actually on the European Central Bank website, searching and searching and searching. And according to the European Central Bank in this presentation that they have at this link, it's a PDF. You can simply type that into your browser. I've highlighted the key point. It will enter force on 27th of June, 2019, the CRR, but the NSFR specifically will be in force on the 27th of June, 2021. All right, so now we get it. NSFR has been pushed around from 2018 to 2021. Other parts of Basel III have been pushed back to 2023. But at the end of the day, this is all moved around. What does all of this mean? Why do we care about these dates? Well, one, because people are hounding me on Twitter to give all of these precise dates because, and I'll explain why in a moment, because they, I think, I based on the responses, I think they think it's going to be the end of the gold derivative suppression scheme, which is going to cause gold to rise. And I'll talk about that in detail, my thoughts on that here in a moment. Uh, that's the main reason, but also... Uh, it, the bigger picture here and the, and the part that really matters and what I really want to focus on, the fact that when the Basel III requirements came out uh, in 2014 or, the, or they were started work on 2014, they're supposed to be implemented in 2018, you know, nine years or 10 years after the, the financial collapse and uh, the Lehman issue that almost brought down the financial system. They still couldn't comply with Basel III. So the biggest picture is regardless of what we're talking about NSFR, all these other Basel requirements, they can't comply with the Basel III requirements. They keep having to push them around. And there's this neat little chart on the BAS.org website. I didn't include it. But basically, they've, they've been looking at the liquidity ratios. And they said for the last several years, there hasn't been an issue. They basically have got it amended. So the last four or five years, the banks have been fully capitalized. Well, they've been fully capitalized, according to that chart. Why do they keep pushing, pushing the Basel timelines around? Why did they move back the net stable funding ratio all the way back to 2021, which is three years after its original implementation. Why did they move all these other ones back to 2023 from 2022? Because they couldn't meet them, obviously. So what will happen is the banks will tell you that they meet all of the requirements of Basel III, and they'll show you this wonderful chart. But if you really dig around into a bunch of documents on the internet, you find that, well, they really don't. And that's really kind of the bombshell here, is that they're still having trouble meeting all these requirements. So don't believe the banks when they say they're properly capitalized and funded, according to Basel III. I don't think they are. Otherwise, just, you know, they wouldn't have moved the standards around. Anyway, moving on. So the LBMA is affected by the net stable funding ratio because it's a derivative gold market. And derivatives, according to Basel III and SFR requirements, those markets must be backed by 85% uh, reserve funding requirement. The LBMA falls into that because it's an unallocated gold market. Therefore, it is a derivative gold market. That is key. Remember that. So here at this link from the LBMA, there are some risks they say could happen if in 2021, the LBMA is required to meet the Basel III and SFR requirements for 85% backing. Should, and here's a direct quote, should the 85% RSF requirement be introduced, we may see a rise in the cost of the clearing and settlement service provided by LPMCL, which may impact the service, a fall in market liquidity as banks look to exit the market, and a rise in the cost of business across the supply chain. So we've got rising costs on the LBMA, which would then raise costs across the supply chain. Why? Because a lot of people participate in the LBMA market and the COMEX market. And so if the costs rise in the LBMA, it raises costs across the entire world gold market. That's what you want to get from this. There'll also be a fall in market liquidity as banks look to exit the market. Why? Because if some banks can't meet that 85% ratio, they got to get out. That means the derivative market in London shrinks. That means the ability of London to meet the requirements of the gold market from a derivative perspective uh, goes away. It de-emphasizes London. We'll get more into that later. So where are we now, given all of this stuff around Basel III and, and NSFR? The LBME, LBMA, OTC gold market, is a derivative market. Therefore, it must follow Basel rules. We said that. LBMA was told by the European Banking Authority, the EBA, that it must meet NSFR requirements. The LBMA's appeal to the Federal Reserve here in the U.S. did not meet with success in avoiding NSFR requirements for its gold market. So as LBMA is an unallocated gold market, it faces some hard choices or face losing market share and possibly closing shop as the once dominant physical gold market of the world. So even though there are other physical gold markets, a lot of, you know, as a percentage, 
more of the Chinese, the China Shanghai gold market is physical than derivative, even though it still has derivative trade. Uh, so Chinese is the highest between China's market, London's market, and the U.S. COMEX. But even but even though it is, it still has derivative, and we'll pay attention to why that's key here in a moment. Well, before we get into what I predict is going to happen when this all comes down in June of this year, I want to talk about some other items indicating stress of the LBMA market. This was covered in my first video. I'm going to bring it up again because it talks about how panicked the LBMA is right now. And it's actually reaching out and attacking other physical gold centers around the world, other physical gold markets. So the LBMA recently sent a letter to the rest of the world gold markets threatening sanctions on physical gold trade sourced through African artisanal gold mines, according to Reuters. Now, Reuters in this article that I have linked here in blue, which is still there, I just reread it again today, claims they received this letter, though I can't find this letter anywhere. I can't find it on the LBMA's website, can't find it through searches in the internet. It may be there somewhere, but it's buried. So we're just going to take Reuters' opinion for that right now. Principally, the article and people I've talked to in the gold market think that the LBMA was really attacking Dubai and in the, in the UAE gold market specifically because of Af the gold potentially flowing through that market through African artisanal gold mines, which is hard to track because it's a, mostly a cash market. So it's very difficult to tell, but we think that's why the LBMA is doing it, or at least the reason why they say they're doing it. I think they're doing it because they're afraid of other uh, gold uh, physical gold markets, especially those that trade in cash, that are less derivative than the others. Because why? Because if the LBMA can't meet NSFR requirements, guess where that gold trade is going to go? It's going to go to those other markets. Aha, and that's the key. So I believe that's why LBMA was lashing out against other gold markets, but really focusing on uh, the UAE market and making up the excuse about the African artisanal gold mines. Now, there's only about $13 billion worth of gold that flowed through those uh, gold mines, according to the latest data I had. I think it was like 2019 or 2020 data. So it's a fraction of the overall physical gold market across the world. So really, you know, this could be the LBMA reaching here. Well, Dubai had a response. And it basically was like, hey, LBMA, that's like the pot calling the kettle black. So there's a response by the executive chairman at the DMCC, Ahmed Bin, bin Sulayam. And this is posted at LinkedIn. I've got the link for you right here. You can simply type that in and go to it, read it yourself. And he has basically three points for the LBMA to consider in their criticism of uh, the UAE gold market. Should LBMA be sued for maintaining a trade monopoly? Because basically the LBMA's derivative position has created a trade monopoly on the price of gold and the trade of physical gold, even though it's an unallocated gold market. And I happen to agree with the chairman here. Will LBMA apply the same standard to its participants, such as JP Morgan, which was fined a record $920, $920 billion for gold and US treasury market manipulation? So again, pot calling kettle black. $13 billion in potential uh, source gold from artisanal African gold mines versus $920 billion for JP Morgan as a participant in both the COMEX and LBMA rigging the gold market, which is bigger. I'll leave that to you to figure out. Go after the offending, uh, I'm sorry, it's $920 million fine. I've got a, a typo, ho, typo here. $920 million fine, except for the fine was for rigging uh, the market that controls billions and billions of dollars. Uh, apologies for the misprint there. The other point uh, that Ahmed made was go after the offending country's mine operations, not the free market gold hub such as UAE. UAE. So in other words, if there are these artisanal gold mines in Africa producing this, uh, what you would call maybe conflict gold or gold that uses child labor or, or maybe unsavory practices, then go after the mines that are doing it and the countries that are regulating that, not the free gold, gold hubs in which that gold could be coming through. Because at the end of the day, those gold hubs couldn't 100% tell where that gold came from. They could suspect it, but they can't control it. So if the LBMA is going to criticize anybody, go after the mines and the countries themselves, uh, not just pick on the UAE. And I happen to agree with them. So I, I think, you know, logically, you can say, say that the LBMA is attacking uh, the UAE gold hub because they're actually afraid of it, not because of the artisanal gold mining. That's my opinion. So what, have, what does all of this mean? Now let's kind of circle around and make the argument. We know that in June of 2021, LBMA participants will be required to back their derivative gold positions by 85% as per Basel rules known as NSFR. The LBMA knows this will slow gold trade through the London gold market, raise costs, and force some participating bullion banks out of the market. The raised costs and reduced liquidity will likely shift market participants over to other gold markets, such as the US, South Africa, China, et cetera. 
What it ends up mean, meaning is the West gold monopoly game may be over. Essentially, what this what can happen is that the collusion that we have documented on our channel on Gold Silver Pros between the COMEX and the LBMA unallocated gold schemes may finally be coming to an end. Maybe not exactly in June, but fairly soon thereafter. And this will likely have the effect of pushing the real physical gold trade east to China, Russia, along with, to a lesser extent, the Middle East and African markets. And finally, the derivative control over gold prices is likely breaking before our eyes. This is why people were pushing me on Twitter to get more precise dates on when NSFR was coming into play. I wasn't really paying attention to the actual precise date because I don't think the precise date is going to be the day in which this thing blows up. And I'll explain here in a moment. Last night's video, I talked about a CPI adjusted price of gold, the previous high in 1980 being $3,045 in today's money. So if the derivative market blows up because of the NSFR and the Basel III requirements, does, does that mean that gold will reach its inflation adjusted price, previous high in 1980 of $3,045 in June? This is a reasonable landing point for gold when derivative market overhang is removed, I argue. But there are also reasons why this will not happen immediately. Let's examine those. And that, I think, is the big takeaway from this presentation. The gold market is distributed. While most of the derivative market in gold is centered in Western trading hubs, COMEX and LBMA, not all of it is. China's Shanghai exchange is not purely physical gold market either. Okay, not all of the gold exchanges are purely physical. All of them have derivatives to some degree. And maybe even to a bigger extent from the retail trade perspective, ETF products such as GLD are largely subsidized with gold that is very likely leased from other central holders such as central banks and other large uh, gold holding parties. E.g. is not completely owned free and clear when it gets into the ETF. So there could be title issues, chain of title issues. The reason I say that is research that somebody I trust in this industry has done extensively. And I've got the video in which we talked to Nick Barashev, CEO of BMG Group, in which we talk about the gold flows and ETFs and how they cannot possibly be with gold completely with completely free and clear titles. That has to do with how much gold they've been taking in, the cost of running the ETF, so on and so forth. We've got this documented in detail on my YouTube channel on a video called here at the bottom, how the massive gold and silver theft really works. This is from an expert in the gold industry, Nick Bereshev, which runs his own gold fund in Canada. He's a big player in the market. He's studied this. He knows. He's read the authorized participant agreements of these ETFs, and he knows how they're worded, and he knows how they work. You can simply type this URL at the bottom uh, into uh, your browser, and you'll find that video, or just search for my video from a couple months ago entitled How the Massive Gold and Silver Theft Really Works. It's right here on this channel. Why do I believe Nick Bereshev? Because every time I talk to him, he's extremely knowledgeable. And I talked with David Morgan on the phone a few months ago last year. And David Morgan told me that Nick Bereshev might be the smartest gold guy that he knows. And that's high praise because David Morgan's been in this for a very long time. He's known as a silver guru. and He's extremely smart. If he endorses Nick Bereshev, you can take it to the bank that Nick Bereshev probably knows what he's talking about. And I've interviewed Nick Bereshev several times, including at my conference last August. He's a very intelligent individual. So go watch that video. So in other words, what all this means, there's still derivatives that are going to exist, even if the COMEX and LBA May scheme collapses. Now, will it exist at the level that they existed at the COMEX and LBA? Probably not, but they'll still exist. Gold derivatives will still exist. It's not going to completely remove the derivatives. And probably most importantly, the central bank's reasons for controlling the gold market aren't going to change. They still need to create the perception that fiat currencies are stable. When you have a rapidly rising gold price, it creates a perception that fiat currencies are not stable. Therefore, they cannot allow gold to completely run up to $3,000 an ounce or anywhere near that in June. A run on any fiat currency will cause a run on all of them. That's another reason why. The interconnectedness of the exchanges. Think about the currency exchanges. Think about the debt system. Think about foreign reserves. Everybody's holding everybody else's currencies. Everybody has an incentive not to let the dollar and the euro and the Chinese yuan and all these currencies fail. Everybody does because it would affect their own markets. And think about the SDR, special drawing rights. Okay, The special drawing right is how, uh, at a supranational level, how currencies are negotiated. That includes the Chinese yuan, the pound, the euro, the dollar, okay? It's a, it's a basket of five current major currencies. 
So SDRs would be affected if any of the fiat currencies fail that make up that SDR. And if any of the fiat currencies, any of the fiat currencies would fail or would rapidly move toward failure, if gold all of a sudden ju jumped $1,000 an ounce in a couple of months. Also, the commercial banks finance each other in debt. So they, if we have a failure of a currency and therefore a failure of that debt system that that currency is denominated in, you would start having failures in the commercial banking system. They don't want that to happen. It would make the Lehman failure look like a walk in the park on a Sunday. We're talking a real collapse of the global financial system. And further, everyone owns treasuries tied to the US dollar, including China, which owns the Shanghai exchange. So even though China may want more gold trade to come its way, they don't want the dollar to just up and fail because think about all of the US treasuries they hold in US dollar terms. They want to exit that market slowly, not all at once and not at an 85, 90% haircut cut because that market is collapsing right in front of their eyes. Therefore, it is in the best interest of central banks around the world and governments not to let gold run too high too fast. Okay, There are a lot of incentive not to let gold run too high too fast. Hence, gold running to 2060, 2070 last year and then coming back down now into the mid 1800s. Ring a bell, anyone? Why do the derivative markets exist? For all the reasons I have on this screen right now, and there, it's not only in the interest of the Western central banks and governments, it's also in the interest of the Eastern central banks and governments who have commingled their business, their debt and fiat currency systems with that of the US and the UK. That's why you really have to pay, pay attention to what's going on in the global markets, not just the gold market, but the debt and currency markets as well. All right. How will they control the gold price then, Rob, if the NSFR basically causes a major shift in the LBMA unallocated gold market? Wouldn't that also affect COMEX? Wouldn't that also affect the gold price? Yes, but there's still things that they can do. Here's things that I brainstormed today. It's very likely, in fact, probably 100% chance that plans are being made right now to bolster the Western gold markets. How would they do it? Well, remember the NSFR rule just said backing for derivatives. It doesn't mean you have to have 85% gold. You could do it with cash. So maybe the central banks print some cash they hand it over to the market participants and they bolster the liquidity ratios that way. That's possible. Maybe with more physical lease from central parties. Remember, we're saying that ETFs like gold are using some leased gold that's actually owned and titled to someone else. Maybe they do that for the London and the COMEX markets. That's if there's any left. We don't know how much is left. They won't have all that data, but it's possible they could do some of that. So they're probably going to do one or all of these things is what I'm advocating. If they want to prevent a rapid failure of the Western derivative gold markets. They may also uh, add more physical loaned by large holders in the LBMA and COMEX vaults. So remember, there is some allocated gold in the LBMA and COMEX vaults. Maybe they entice those private gold holders to lease them their gold through some incentives, cash, higher lease rates, promises to pay, stock, issuance of debt. I don't know. There's all sorts of ways they could do it or through agreement with other physical gold hunts. Maybe they go to the Worldwide Gold Hub and say, hey, if the LBMA and COMEX collapse, that's going to affect your gold trade. Let's get some physical off your markets to help us bolster it, and we'll do something for you. That it, They may actually be able to do some of that. Whether or not you know China and Dubai and, and all these other gold markets comply, I don't know, but that's a possibility. The question is, will all of these potential stopgap measures work that I've, that I've brainstormed, and maybe even with some that they're considering that I haven't brainstormed for a while? I think that all of these measures will help stem the complete collapse of the Western gold market derivative, at least like in a single day or in a single month for a while. Why? They need time. The central banks of the world and the governments of the world still need time to finish the infrastructure of the new digital currency systems. If they let fiat systems fail now and they don't have the alternative, that allows people to choose their own currencies. The central banks and governments don't want that. They want to have the solution in place before the system collapses. Therefore, they're going to prop it up. They cannot let fiat currencies or bond markets collapse just yet. We're not quite there, I don't think. Therefore, they must still control gold's rise to an extent. Therefore, they must mitigate the issues with the Western derivative gold markets. They have no other choice. How long? My guess is two to three years before they let it go all the way. I could be wrong. Could be sooner. Could be later. Don't know. But I think they're. I think we've still got a little bit more time before complete complete collapse. Com sorry, complete collapse. I do think, however that there's, there's going to be a big event in June. In June 2021, I do think gold price is going to rise. Maybe it hits another plateau. Maybe it permanently sits at 2100 and above, um, you know, as awareness is generated. But remember, 
most people in the Western markets, about a half a percent to a percent, depending on where you are, actually own gold, whether it be in derivative form or in physical form. So it's not as if most of the financial media is actually going to talk about the NSFR, you know, and, and how this affects the Western gold markets. You're going to hear it on this channel. You may hear it with a couple of people that cover the London gold market. There's going to be a handful of us talking about it up until June. And then June, when it happens, if they're trying to manage the, the slow failures of those markets, the financial media is not going to cover it. Okay. So if, if, 40 or 50% of people held physical gold, you know, in the Western markets, and it were a bigger part of their portfolio. Um, I think the loss of confidence in those derivative markets would have happened already. And certainly in June when the NSFR requirements in Basel III are implemented for sure. But because so little people actually have exposure to gold, I don't think everybody's going to figure it out yet. And if everybody's not figuring it out yet, you're not going to have the mass rush into physical gold just yet. Will it increase interest in the gold? Yes. Will it increase costs and therefore rise the price? Yes. Will it reduce liquidity? Yes. All of those things will bolster the gold price, but I think it's going to be more of a stair step down than just a complete waterfall collapse of the system. Okay, now on to the very, very special announcement we have for you today. The last two days, I've been talking about my conference coming up on January 28th. That is exactly one week from today, in which we are going to have uh, a, a whole panel of speakers for you. So far, we've got almost 300 people registered in two days. That's awesome because I just announced this two days ago. So we're marching to over a thousand users. And I want to set a goal for you guys. I want to set a goal of 1500. Let's make this a super special and fun conference with 1500 people in it. It's going to be lively. It's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of interaction. Let's set that as our goal. Let's get those registrations up. It is free tickets, by the way. You can go to this page, hopin.com forward slash events forward slash solutions 2021 and register for free as an attendee. No cost to you. I'm footing the cost of the conference. Happy to do so. Uh, you guys can register for that. And the very special announcement is that we have got a very new guest. The one and only Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics is joining the conference to discuss what do we do when the dollar dies. So Chris is going to be joining us there. I know a lot of you love Chris as much as I do. Happy to have him joining the conference. He is a silver guru, a silver expert. So we're going to stop the share and show you how I know that because he wrote The Big Silver Short by one Chris Marcus, you can see right here. And as a matter of fact, I read this book before most people could, before it was published. And uh, for reading that and uh, giving my opinion on that, I got a quote on the back of Chris's book right here. Now you can't see it because my webcam's not focusing, but you get a copy of the book on the back on the top recommendation there. Highly recommend this book. It's absolutely wonderful. Go to Arcadia Economics and pick up your copy of the Big Silver Short. Uh, and don't tell any, Chris, I told you, but he told me he wants Brad Pitt to play him in the movie, although I might have to talk to him about that one. In any case, uh, very lucky to have Chris joining the program at our conference. Once again, we will show you the conference page. It is called Solutions 2021. It is absolutely free to you. We're going to have a bunch of wonderful uh, guests in addition to Chris. We're going to talk about currency crisis. We're going to talk about gold and silver. We're going to talk about the mining stocks. We got Kerry and Von Hess talking Bitcoin. Uh, we got Alex telling us how to sort through the information to find the truth and be more effective in our investing. We got Christopher Muehlman, the technical traders, talking to us about managing financial risk and much, much more. Looking forward to this big time, guys. Go there and register. We will have the link down in the description for you if you want to register for the conference. That's going to do it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's session. This is Rob Keynes with Gold Silver Pros. See you next time.